diagnosed with ovarian cancer, and uh, a couple years later she passed away. And uh, it was obviously a really hard time on the family. I ended up moving away from my home church, kind of drifted away from the church a little bit. Get, I got a new job. My dad, when I grew up, had uh, a, a bunch of back pain problems, and he uh, was using prescription drugs. He uh, he, he struggled with uh, dealing with the loss of my sister and uh, ended up switching from prescription drugs to heroin. He lost his job. And um, it, like five or six years later, he ended up uh, losing his life over it. So that was another big struggle. But the, the one thing I keep thinking about is that through that whole process, I feel that God was preparing me by getting me back involved in the church community because I was kind of separated from the church and the body. And I feel that God knew that I was going to need the, the church family and him when my, when my dad passed. From my Bible study group, from the worship band, just everybody. It just surrounded us with love, and I, I never felt God's presence like that moment. And God just, just flooded me with his grace and mercy. Gratitude to yours, to Ryan, as he's uh, served us well these many years, so I appreciate you, Ryan, and glad you've been with us all this time. I also want to thank Tim for his little video there. I see Tim you know, every other week or so when I'm out at Kesslinger campus, and a uh, great guy, and always upbeat, and we chat just a bit before services, but I didn't know that part of his story. It's good to know. Sometimes you just don't know what people are dealing with uh, week in and week out. Well, I'm going to read to you the lyrics of... Um, a song we hear often this time of year, and I want you to think about who you first heard sing it. It goes like this. It was the most wonderful time of the year, with the kids jingle belling and everyone telling you be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Okay, who'd you first hear sing that song? Oh, louder. Andy Williams, right. Do you know what year? Careful. That's kind of a creepy picture, I know, but that's the one I could find. 1963, he recorded that in his Christmas album, and it became famous. It's kind of the, one of the soundtrack songs of this time of the year, the most wonderful time of the year. Now, if I ask you today, how many of you agree that this is the most wonderful time of the year? Some of you would raise your hands. Maybe most of you would raise your hands. I'd probably raise my hand. I love this time of year. I love everything about Christmas. I even like some of the stuff I probably shouldn't like that much about Christmas. I like to walk around our neighborhood at night just by myself, sometimes with my wife. And I just like looking at the lights and the yards and the houses decorated. And I like every, except the, the big inflated Santas. I, I want to shoot those with a BB gun. But <laughs> the rest of it, I kind of like. It gives me this feeling of kind, of kind of peacefulness and joy, like everything is right in my world. Even with the busyness of the shopping and the special events and, like Laura said, 10 Christmas Eve services coming up this weekend, it's just a special fun time of the year. But my guess is some of you would hesitate in raising your hands. Because even though you understand what Christmas means, the busyness and the shopping and all that has just sort of drained all the fun out of it for you. Maybe this Christmas you're missing a loved one friend of mine in this church lost his dad just yesterday. Doesn't feel so wonderful for him. Or maybe you're between jobs and the economic pressure is kind of getting to you. Or maybe just the flu has come to your house. The truth is if we look around us, there are all kinds of reasons to be troubled because lots of things are troubling. Politics, accusations, misconduct, Gun violence, threats of terrorism, bank robberies. You see in our region there's been like seven bank robberies in the last like three weeks? And did I mention politics? You could actually make an argument that Christmas, this Christmas, is maybe the most stressful time of the year. The least peaceful time of the year. We're in our fourth week of our Advent series that's called Simply With 
As you know, that title comes from one of the titles given to Jesus in the Bible, Emmanuel, God who is with us. And so far we've looked at the promise, and then the presence, and then the power of Emmanuel, and today we're looking at the peace of Emmanuel. So let's read again. I want you to listen again to the famous story in Luke chapter 2. Luke writes, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. We all know the story, but today I want to look at the story from the perspective of peace. And the first thing I want to look at is a surprising peace, a surprising peace. How many of you here today had a distant family relative, like a grandfather, a great uncle, who served in the armed forces during World War I. World War I. Any connections? Yeah, a few of us. My grandfather, uh, my dad's dad, who died in 1939, I, I never met him, served in World War I and was in France for a short period of time. My wife's grandfather was wounded in France during that war. So how many of you have heard of the Christmas truce of 1914? Famous story, movies been made about it, and it's, a, it's an amazing story. It took place um, when the war was only about five months old in France. Over 800,000 men had already been killed or wounded, even after five months. Uh, the British and German forces are engaged in brutal trench warfare. And on Christmas Eve of 1914, English soldiers huddled in their trenches, heard singing coming from the German trenches just a few yards away from them. And they recognized the song they were singing in German. It was Silent Night, Holy Night. And then the British began to chime in and sing from their trench. And back and forth they sang these Christmas carols until the next morning they laid down their weapons and the soldiers from both sides met in the middle of what they called no man's land. This is an actual picture of the soldiers gathered together there. And they exchanged small gifts, chocolate, cigarettes, and even played a friendly game of soccer on Christmas Day. One soldier later wrote in his diary, What a sight! Little groups of Germans and British extending almost the length of our front. Out of the darkness we could hear laughter and see lighted matches, a German lighting a Scotsman's cigarette and vice versa, and exchanging souvenirs. Here we were laughing and chatting to men whom only a few hours before we were trying to kill. So in 1914, Christmas brought a spontaneous outbreak of peace in the middle of the worst war humankind had ever seen. A surprising peace. In the same way, the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, did not come at a particularly peaceful time in history. You know the story. Israel was occupied by the armies of Rome. The Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, a man who considered himself to be a god, issued a decree that announced a new tax. The decree required every Jewish man to re register his family in his ancestral home. So Joseph, just an ordinary Jewish carpenter, was being forced by a pagan emperor to drag his fiancée, who was nine months expectant, on a 90-mile trek, probably on foot, just so they could be taxed more by the Roman Empire. Not a peaceful time. And on top of all of that, when they finally arrive at their destination, Bethlehem, there are no rooms left to be had, so she delivers her baby in what must have been a kind of stable or cave for animals because she lays him in a manger which we think of, think of as kind of an ancient uh, uh, crib, but it really was a, an animal feeding trough. And you moms out there, how many of you would choose that as the first place you would lay a child? It was not a peaceful time. In the midst of all that, an announcement comes. We continue the great story in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Another translation reads that last verse, Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now notice, this was not a particularly peaceful time for the shepherds either, at least not at first. The Bible says they were terrified, filled with great fear. So what kind of peace? The word used here in the New Testament out of Greek is eirene, which means unity and accord, which is a translation of the Old Testament word in Hebrew, shalom. Shalom is a beautiful word that in that culture at that time meant peace and harmony, prosperity, completeness, and is the result of the presence and blessing of God himself. And this peace is a different kind of peace. Because it's not peace as in the absence of trouble. It's peace that we can know in the midst of trouble. Because it's a peace that comes from a different source. Notice Luke says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Sometimes I think we are so familiar with the word Christ that we think of it as kind of a kind of like Jesus' last name. But it's really a title. It's a title that means anointed one or Messiah. So the announcement means that this child, the child lying in a manger, fulfills the great prophecies of the Old Testament, in particular the prophecy of Isaiah that says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So the prophet is telling us that this surprising peace is not found in circumstances. It's not found in good health. It's not found in politics. It's found in a person. And that person is the child in the manger. Emmanuel brings a surprising peace. Secondly, I want us to see that he brings also a personal peace. Personal peace. How many of you are going to watch, you think, at least one movie this holiday season? Anybody watch movies? Oh, a few of you. Now, if you only could watch one, the entire Christmas season, you can only watch one, which one would you watch? Would you watch, for example, It's a Wonderful Life? How many fans? You know, the story of George Bailey, the richest man in town. Or would you watch one of my favorites, A Christmas Story? story of Ralphie and his longing for the Red Rider BB gun. Or maybe you would watch a classic like Charles Dickens' story, A Christmas Carol. It tells the timeless story of Ebenezer Scrooge. My favorite actor for that was George C. Scott. There are lots of them, but that's the version I like. Scrooge was a miserly and joyless man whose love for money drives him to inflict hardship and pain on others and robs him of most of his relationships. Until on Christmas Eve, he's visited by three ghosts or spirits, kind of a nightmare. The spirit of Christmas past, the spirit of Christmas present, and the spirit of Christmas future. And those spirits help Scrooge see the pain that his selfishness has inflicted on others, as well as the emptiness and hopelessness of his own life. And a miracle happens in the story. Scrooge is He's kind of reborn. He's transformed. And overnight, he becomes a joyful and generous man. And most of us recognize that story as sort of an allegory of the gospel. That this is the good news of great joy that the angels were talking about. That God has come in the flesh and that the infant in the manger became the man on the cross. And the man on the cross rose again from the dead. The good news is that through Jesus... We can have peace with the past. Peace with your past. A number of years ago, I got a call in my office uh, here at this campus, and the man on the other end, I had never met before, uh, but he knew who I was, and he said that he wanted to talk to me about something. And I said, sure, what do you, want to, what do you need to talk about? And he said, well, I, I, I can't talk about it over the phone. It's so serious, I can't talk about it over the phone. Can you come and meet me? So I did. I, that, a couple days later, I drove uh, to his home, and we sat down, and he confessed in that conversation 
that he had done something years earlier in his life, 20 or 30 years earlier, that he feared was so unforgivable that that event by itself was going to keep him out of heaven after he died. And he was nearing the end of his life. So his question was, will that, that thing I did that I've never told anyone except you, will that keep me out of heaven? So I asked him if he understood and believed what Jesus had done for him. What the Bible says, what he did for him on the cross. He said he did. So then I explained that the Bible says that on the cross, through the cross, Jesus forgave all our sin. Colossians chapter 2, nailed them to the cross. And so then we prayed together, and through tears, he trusted the forgiveness of Christ. He experienced what Paul promises in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God means peace with our past, all our sin. But God with us also means we can know peace in the present. That is right now. Uh, A few years ago when one of our boys was little, uh, he uh, didn't like to go in areas of our house that were unoccupied, or especially if they were dark. So uh, if he needed to run down to the basement to get a toy or something, he would go over to the basement doorway, stairway going down, it's dark. He would just stand there and he would stop at the top of the stairs and just stare down into the abyss. And he but he wouldn't go down. And he had been there before, but he just didn't like it when it was dark. So he would look at me, and I'd look at him. Go on, buddy. He'd look down, look at me. He'd say, it's dark, Daddy. I'd say, I know, it's dark. You can go down. You've been there a million times. You can do it. Not very helpful. And then he'd say, (laughs) he'd say, I'm scary. I'm scary. He'd say, I'm scary. Will you come? So I'd get up from whatever important thing I was doing, like watching a Bulls game, and I'd go over (laughs) and take him by the hand, and we'd go down the stairs. He'd get his thing and come up. Well, Within a few months, all I had to do was come over and stand at the top of the stairs, and he could do it. After a while, he would just look over. As long as he knew I was watching from where I was, he could do it on his own. Something about my presence helped him conquer his fear. I think most of us know what it's like to feel like my little son, looking down into a dark basement. There's plenty of things that cause us to feel troubled or anxiety or fear. You may be You may be facing a dark stairway right now in some way in your life. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious about anything. That's a remarkable phrase by itself. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now notice that Paul does not tell us that prayer will change our circumstances. The basement is still dark. Rome still rules a troubled world. Caesar still levied his tax. Sin and death and trouble are all around. But rather, he says that through prayer, we know the presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And his presence guards our hearts and minds. We can have peace in the present. God with us also means we can have peace about the future. About the future. A couple of months ago, a woman called me and asked if I'd be willing to visit her father who was in the hospital. Uh, He was facing some um, uh, difficult health issues, aging and uh, a risky surgery was coming up. And she said that he had put his faith in Christ and had been baptized right here in this church, but but she sensed he was anxious and fearful. So I went to visit him in the hospital. And we chatted just a bit, and I asked him about the surgery he was going to have the very next day. And and then just just as soon as I asked him, he said, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to make it through the surgery. I'm afraid to die. He just blurted it right out there. I'm afraid I'm going to die. So we talked a little bit. I acknowledged that, yeah, yeah, it's a fearful time. It's normal to feel anxious. But I reminded him of the promises of Scripture. 1 Peter chapter 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So we prayed together in the hospital, 
and he, he gained some sense of peace heading into the surgery. Now, he survived that surgery, but within a few weeks, all the issues piled up, and he passed away, and we actually did his funeral. So I was so glad that we were able to have just those few minutes of prayer when he could anchor his hope and have peace about the future. So Emmanuel brings a surprising peace and a personal peace, but also a relational peace. What do I mean by relational peace? I'm sure most of you recognize the name John McCain. John McCain is most well-known for his tough-minded conservatism. He's a senator, senator, and he's currently battling a brain tumor. But he's got a very interesting story going back to the 60s because he was also a POW during the Vietnam War. Many of you have read his story. He was a POW for some five and a half years, uh, and he spent two of those years in solitary confinement. And he tells his story in, in several of his memoirs. And during those two years, his captors used torture, trying to extort a confession out of him. Uh, and in describing that time, he says that almost every day for those two years, a certain guard, one particular guard, would come into his cell and would order him to bow down on his knees before this guard. And whenever he would refuse, this guard would punch him and strike him and kick him until he knocked him to the ground, often leaving him unconscious. Every day for two years. McCain says, I've never hated another human being so much. It's a powerful line. But he said there was another guard during that same time. One night when McCain was tied up in what they called torture ropes, they would tie him up so it inflicted great pain and leave him that, that way all night so he couldn't sleep. One night he was tied up like that, laying there in agony on his prison in, in his cell floor, and this other guard entered the room and without a word just loosened his ropes enough so where he could sleep. And then came back in in the morning and tightened him again before anybody could discover the kindness he had offered him. Didn't say a word. McCain was grateful, but he was confused. And then a couple of weeks later, which happened to ha uh, be on Christmas morning, he was standing in the prison yard by himself, and that guard who had loosened his ropes walked up next to him, again without speaking, in the prison yard, stood next to him for a few moments, and reached out with his sandal and drew a cross in the dirt. Left it there for a couple of minutes without saying a word and then rubbed it out and walked away. McCain today, to this day, says that simple gesture helped him endure the horrific experience in the prison camp. That cross in the dirt is also a picture of what I'm calling relational peace. Paul says in Ephesians 2, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Then down in verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the, host the, the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to, you tho to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Now, in these words, Paul is describing the miracle of the church, specifically how those who were once enemies, talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, were made one. The dividing barrier has been destroyed through the cross. But he's also explaining what happened to John McCain in that prison yard, the cross in the dirt, making the two one. He's explaining how we can experience relational peace, between friends, in families, in homes, between people groups, between enemies, and between nations. Because peace comes through the cross. I used to see a bumper sticker quite often. Don't see it as much anymore, but I used to see it quite often. It just simply said, visualize world peace. Do you remember seeing that? visualize world peace. Now, I, I, my reaction was kind of, uh, uh, I'd say, well, what, what good does that do? I mean, visualize. I also saw another bumper sticker that said, visualize using your turn signal. And I like that one too. But. <laughs> you don't have to be a historian or a social scientist to see and understand two things. First, we all want peace in the world. Peace would be a good thing. The bumper sticker's right. World peace would be a wonderful thing. But the second thing we see is the world's not at peace. Not by a long shot. Two truths seem to collide in the Bible. Jesus is called 
the Prince of Peace. That's the first one. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But secondly, the world is not at peace. So what gives? Jesus actually speaks to both of these, to this collision in John chapter 16 when he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. On the one hand, peace. On the other, tribulation. So what do we make of this this collision? Jesus came, the Bible says, as Emmanuel, the God who is with us, to bring peace. First of all, peace with God. Jesus forgives our sin, restores our relationship with the Holy God, and promises eternal salvation, peace. Secondly, he makes it possible for us to have peace with others, relational peace. But what about world peace? What about wars and terrorism and injustice and politics? As followers of Jesus, the Bible says we are to pray for peace, that we are to pursue peace, that we are to work for peace, but we also are to understand that ultimately the world will not know true peace until the Prince of Peace returns again, which is a promise. Revelation chapter 21, then I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God, notice, is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. Three times the word with. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. That's the promise, ultimately, of the Prince of Peace. Years ago, I met a retired missionary named Chuck Holsinger. was was just a sweet, wonderful man of God. And he, he's passed, he passed away, went to be with the Lord a few years ago. But... 35 years ago, I heard him tell a story that I remember to this day. Uh, He tells a story of being a young missionary in the 1950s in Taiwan. Uh, He and his wife were expecting their first child. And right as the time for his wife to deliver uh, came, he was called uh, by a church on the other side of the island to come over and help with some issue. I don't remember anymore what it was. He didn't want to go because his wife was going to have this baby there first, and so, but he, he felt obligated to go. So he, he traveled by bus from one side of Taiwan to the other, eight-hour trip. No sooner did he get there than there was a telegram waiting for him back in the days of telegrams. The telegram simply said, come quickly, complications. He didn't know anything else. His heart just sunk. He had left his wife. She was in trouble. So he went to the bus station. He bought uh, a ticket for an express bus, a nonstop bus to get back to the other side of the island as fast as possible. So he gets on the bus and he just starts to pray. He's overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. He starts to pray. About two hours into the trip, he feels the bus slowing down. And he's irritated because he bought an expensive ticket for an express bus. It wasn't supposed to stop. He looks out the window to see why they're stopping. And there's there's a Taiwanese farmer waving the bus down from the side of the road. And the bus is slowing down. He doesn't know why. Bus stops, Taiwanese farmer gets on, a total stranger to Chuck, walks back down the aisle, makes eye contact with him, sits in the seat right next to him. And as soon as he sits down, he reaches over, touches his knee, and says, Ping on. Which in the Mandarin dialect was a phrase that meant peace, like, like bon voyage, have a, have a safe, peaceful journey, but also could mean mother and child are well. It's a complicated phrase, ping on. And every couple of minutes as they drove this bus, this farmer that he did not know would say, ping on, ping on. About an hour later, bus starts to slow down again. And the bus slows down, stops. The farmer gets up, walks off the bus, gets off and standing on the side of the road. And Chuck is just baffled by the whole thing. And as the bus takes off, he's looking out the window and this farmer is standing on the side of the road with his hand raised yelling at the top of his lungs, ping on, ping on. And Chuck says over the next hour, his fear just melted away. The anxiety melted away. This overwhelming sense of peace came over him. When he got home, he found his daughter had been born healthy. His wife was safe and well. 
But the point of the story was, was, the reason Chuck tells it, is that the experience of peace came before he knew his wife and baby were fine. Peace. We all face times when the world is not at peace. When our world is not at peace. Maybe a peaceful time for you, joyful time, but maybe not. Maybe it feels like you're standing at the top of a dark stairway looking down into the darkness. Maybe you're on an anxiety-filled bus ride for some reason. You don't know what waits at the other end. Maybe there's some sin or pain in your past that's haunting you through the years. The story we remember is that God came into this broken world. And the birth of Emmanuel means God is with us. God is with you. And that Jesus is your Prince of Peace. Would you bow with me as I close today? Lord, thank you so much for your word, for this great story of your coming into our world to be with us. And may your spirit bring peace to our hearts, peace to our relationships, peace to our homes, and one day, peace to this broken world. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Just before I pronounce the benediction, remember there are prayer team members available just following the service. If you'd like to spend a few moments in personal and confidential prayer, they'd love to spend that time with you. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who is Emmanuel, the God who is with us. Amen. Have a great day.